Nearly 440,000 Hawaii residents cast a ballot in the last presidential election. That represented only about 62% of all eligible voters. Were you one of them? Will you be voting on Tuesday? If so, you should know as an active voter, a participant in the democratic process, you have become more important, more critical to what's at stake than ever before. Tonight's insights is about the power and privilege of voting. We'll hear from a millennial voter who thinks there is too much at stake not to be counted. Another voter who has shown up for decades at Hawaii's polling places and recalls waiting for the results of races she will always remember. And a recently naturalized U.S. citizen who will vote in an American election for the very first time. This live broadcast of Insights on PBS Hawaii starts now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Malia Maddock. After decades of high voter turnout, Hawaii turnout hit an all-time low during the 2014 general election when we posted the lowest numbers in the country. Just 52% of registered voters actually cast a ballot. But the dismal statistics may not tell the whole story. Many islanders take the right to vote very seriously. Our guests are here to discuss why voting is and should be a priority. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org. Now to our guests. Colin Moore is Associate Professor of Political Science and Director of the Public Policy Center at the University of Hawaii. Professor Moore's scholarship focuses on American political development, public bureaucracies, health policy, and the historical analysis of institutional change. Wayne Yoshioka is an award-winning journalist with Hawaii Public Radio. He has also worked as a TV reporter, as a spokesperson for the State Department of Defense, Civil Defense, and has commanded a public affairs detachment in Afghanistan in 2006. Mr. Yoshioka is also a decorated combat veteran. Spencer Oshita is a graduate of Iolani School and is a European history and English major with minors in American Studies and Political Science and the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He is the current editor-in-chief of Kaleo o Hawaii, the student newspaper for the university. Shanda De Los Reyes is a senior at UH Manoa, majoring in political science with a minor in peace studies. She currently serves as the legislative fellow and vice chair of external affairs for the Associated Students of the University of Hawaii at Manoa, UH's undergraduate student government. Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Happy to be here. Yeah. Mr. Yoshioka, could you address, do you think the dynamic in Hawaii is different in terms of our voting patterns than nationally? Yes, I think so. Because of the ratio between uh, the Republicans and the Democrats, it's like a ratio of two Democrats per one Republican. So the higher the voter turnout, it really doesn't help the challenger. It helps the majority party. And so if you get a higher 66% uh, uh, turnout rate, you really got a 70% Democratic vote. And if it's 52%, 52.3 percent, like in the uh, 2014 election, it was the same ratio, 70 percent Democrat, 26 percent Republican. So it really is different. Mr. Moore, your take on that. Well, I, I agree with Wayne. I mean, this is this is a unique state. I mean, because I mean, there are other states that have a dominant one party. I mean, Hawaii is a particularly extreme example um, of that. And so our elections don't tend to be particularly competitive. I mean, in the last primary race, a single incumbent lost. Um, and so I think that in part drives our, our low voter turnout. But it's a little more complicated than that because as you suggested when we started the show, Hawaii had a pretty high voter turnout. In fact, it was above 80% until 1988. So what's happened? Well, look, I mean, I think this is one of the great mysteries of local politics. I mean, it's that we used to be a high voter turnout. Now it's really quite low. What happened? It's probably a combination of factors, but no one has the, the one answer. I mean, it's not just that our elections are uncompetitive. It's not just that we're a one-party state. I mean, voting really is a social process. And for whatever reason, and I think that's the troubling thing, um, you created this vicious cycle where people aren't voting, then they don't grow up in households that vote, and our voter turnout gets lower and lower. 
Mr. Oshita, in terms of generationally, do you think it's a generational change that perhaps younger voters aren't as interested in the process? Um, you know, I, I would be remiss if, if I uh, maybe didn't say that voters and younger voters in, in general, it's, it's hard to broad brush them. You know, it's hard to say that all of them are not interested in politics. It's hard to say that all of them are interested in politics. Um, and so when you, when you get a large generation like the millennial generation or like the younger generation, what you're really looking at is such a wide variety of different people uh, that it's really hard to say they don't have interest or they do have interest. Um, I think it, it isn't necessarily a generational thing so much as it is, again, we're looking at local elections. As Colin said, it's very hard to pinpoint. It's very hard to say that there's one reason for low voter turnout. Um, but I think among younger generations, as you saw during the primaries, there was a candidate, uh, Bernie Sanders, who energized that younger population, who energized those people. Um, whether or not that energy will be seen in this general election, um, you know, I'm not so sure. I think a lot of people uh, are sort of turning out to vote against the other candidate in the presidential election. Uh, and so will we see younger people turn out? I think if in these few, you know, the last couple days before the election, uh, one candidate or the other can, can really get to the heart of one of these issues that really touched a younger people, I think we could see some last minute energy bursts. But if not, uh, it's very hard to say. Ms. Delis Ruiz, you obviously are very involved. What do you hear from your peers who perhaps aren't? Do you hear sort of a, a reason given? Right. Um, I've been trying very frequently to register students on campus. Um, it's hard not to have a knee-jerk reaction, especially when they are very upfront. We get this speech about ha not voting for the lesser two evils or um, why vote if these are the two candidates that I have to pick from. Um, it, it's really difficult to say, especially in a state like Hawaii, like we've gone over all together. But what I think it, for many millennials, the political process is mystifying. Uh, it's intimidating and it takes time to learn about politics, time that uh, a lot of young people are using to focus on school, focus on a plethora of other things that are pestering at the time. So. It's, it's really hard to say. And of course, luckily, we do have some very devoted uh, voters here in Hawaii. Tonight, we'll hear from three very different people who have either already voted or definitely will be voting in this 2016 general election. Jean Kiyabu doesn't know how many times she's cast a ballot in a primary or general election. She just knows she's voted in just about all of them since college. I thought about um, all the classwork that went into it, because I remember my civics cl uh, class, and then also just in high school, some of these um, lessons that we had. And um, so the voting process made me think about, and my teachers, and even my parents, because my parents just was a matter of fact thing to do, and it was like, we all waited for our age to come so that we could do it. And we had, we'd have discussions at the table, dinner table, and sometimes I didn't agree with Whoever was running, what my father was saying, I didn't agree, but you know, we had these lively discussions. I remember um, just waiting for that first um, opportunity to vote as an adult. I think I must have been in college. I remember going to the public schools, and then at another time, I went to the district park. So anyway, these city and county and state facilities, and I remember sometimes it was longer lines than others, and so over the years, I decided. Well, now that I know about absentee voting, I decided let's do absentee voting. And I did a permanent um, application so that I always will have a ballot ready. <laughs> I know I, as I'm growing up, I mean, Hawaii has tended to be one party for a long time. So there's that, you know, like a, the balance. I don't know if there's a balance anymore, but, um, and then when I went away, I realized not everybody thought like Hawaii people think. So it's. It was good to see a different point of view in a different part of the country and to hear the discussions you know, in another part. But I, um, I, 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 I realized that the, historically, why Hawaii became more democratic than before. And I know for some of my friends, we're too liberal. <laughs> I remember the, um, 
House of Representatives and the Senate races. There were times when I, I really were, was like sitting on the edge of my seat waiting to see the results of it, you know. And, and then there's a disappointment at, when you realize, oh, well, it's not going to go the way you want it. And then on the other hand, like conceding is also important. It's so gracious when they concede to the other, their opponent and, and you watch that and you realize that's what it's all about. I've heard that too. It's like um, because of the time differences, they feel like it's already been decided, so then my vote wouldn't count. Like, you know, one vote wouldn't really matter. And I'm not so sure if that's a good reason, though, because I think as a citizen, we still have responsibilities. And so fulfilling that part, just doing one part, even if it, you think it's just one vote, I think it's really important um, to have a, that opportunity. Because I often think about the contrast. What if we did not, like women, what if women never had the chance to vote? How, how would that seem? So I think taking that opportunity because it's given to us, it's a freedom, it's a, it's a right, it's just do it. You know, I just think it's very important. There's always um, the, the values or the um, purposes for what we do, why we do things. And if that doesn't really um, override what our, our behavior or our actions of other people, then it's like we're, we're down to, um, we're reducing that, that right to vote as well as you know, just this, this whole process to something that isn't, is not meaningful. So I think we need to realize or go, go above just the ordinary day-to-day um, -day kind of things and, and realize that issues are at stake the values of our country, you know, what we believe in also are at stake. So I think, yes, I believe that as voters, we need to go beyond just what's on the surface. Mr. Moore, did you hear in any of her comments or the profile of some of the more dedicated voters in Hawaii? And, and will those generations to come follow any of those patterns? Well, so, I mean, she sounds like exactly the sort of person who turns out to vote. And when you, when you heard her story, it, it really does come from the family. I mean, she socialized early on into voting to a family that cares about politics. And then it becomes exciting, but it's also she feels empowered that she can make these decisions. She sees this modeled from her parents. And then as you do more of it, you follow the elections because it feels meaningful to you. And so I think um, uh, the speaker we just heard from, yeah, it does have all of the qualities of a typical of a typical voter. But you, you saw this process, right? It really, she doesn't identify a single election that turned her into a, to a voter from a non-voter. It's that politics was always part of her life. And that, I think, also identifies the real challenge in trying to turn around our voter turnout because it's not as if a small tweak to our registration laws is going to make the difference. This is a long and complicated um, psychological process. So it sounds as if if the parents aren't voting, then the chances of the child voting, it, it becomes a lot more challenging. I think we should add uh, another metric. Uh, the Wall Street Journal did a great study, two studies really. One was uh, the states with the highest and lowest voter turnout and the the second one was the states with the highest and lowest homeownership rates. And Minnesota has the highest uh, voter turnout rate, 74%. And you look at their home ownership, it's 73%. On the other end of the spectrum, Hawaii has a low vo voter turnout of 52.3%. And you look at their home ownership rate, and it's also the lowest in the nation at 52%. So if we can you know, either substantiate or refute that, uh, you know, we'd have a lot, of, lot more knowledge in terms of why people vote. Mm -hmm. I guess that speaks to also, for a lot of people in Hawaii, you're working three jobs just to make ends meet, and taking the time to vote feels perhaps a little bit more challenging. Well, I think, I think the homeowners, and this is what I call my uh, skin in the game theory, <laughs> uh, I think that a homeowner will go and consciously vote. Uh, whether you're you know, in that transient stage of coming to Hawaii, you want to live here, but you're renting. Uh, I think the Department of Business and Economic Development says the migration rate from the mainland is minus 19. In other words, 19 people are moving back to the mainland, 19 more people than are moving here. So there's a lot of turmoil in that population. And of course, uh, the cost of housing is probably, or buying a home, not going to dramatically decline anytime soon here. So what then is the answer to that correlation? I think the millennials need to, and they do a lot of studies on the millennials, say they're moving from job to job. But I think eventually they're looking, the larger employers are looking for 
leaders who can lead millennials, and they're going to move up in the pay scale, so to speak. And one thing about succession, and I don't want to mean this in a derogatory way, but even if you do nothing, succession is going to happen. The millennials are going to really inherit the world. So they need to be ready. They need to get involved in the political process, and they need to you know, get involved in trying to solve their own housing issues. Mr. Oshida, did anything strike you listening to her comments in the taped piece? Uh, you know, she said a lot about, um, you know, how typically we're talking about a state where they usually call the election far before our, our polls close. Um, and so it sort of takes the fun out of it, really. You, you're sort of on the edge of your seat until about 1 o'clock p.m. And then all of a sudden, the President of the United States is announced, and that's it. Um, you know, I've actually seen uh, an electoral map um, in which Hawaii could possibly decide the next President of the United States. Um, you know, very unlikely, I think, um, but it is possible. Uh, and what we're looking at is, you know, quite possibly Hillary Clinton taking you know, New England, taking down to Maryland, uh, the West Coast, and Donald Trump basically sweeping the South, uh, taking a lot of the, the, the mountain states. Uh, and if that happens, I think what we'll see is, is, is such a close margin that Hawaii could end up with its only four electoral votes pushing either candidate over the 270 margin. Um, now, obviously, this is possible in any presidential race, but I think what we've seen so far is that none of the pollsters and none of the pundits can really seem to pinpoint um, the true uh, sort of the, the true medium where everything is actually going to fall. And so the fact that this is a possibility, um, I think, can maybe even speak to some voters who really don't feel like voting for anything if the top of the ticket doesn't matter. And I think in this election, it does. Uh, before we go to our next voter, Ms. De Los Reyes, any thoughts on, in terms of what you heard uh, the previous voters speaking about? Right. Just to touch back on uh, what Colin was addressing in terms of being socialized into politics, um, personally, I've had to combat that by uh, going, being active on campus and being socialized as a political science major and as someone who has uh, made hep efforts to uh, galvanized other other people my age. Um, I think education definitely is a valid way of addressing this issue of the lack of engagement. A lot of people again find politics intimidating. I think it would be great if we had a more compre comprehensive way of teaching children starting as early as elementary um, about politics as we've seen so far. Well, let's address that for a few minutes. We had a question, what conversations should young families be having with their children about politics? Mr. Moore, what would be your suggestion? Look, it's not so much about a conversation, it's about modeling the behavior. I mean, if you're civically active, your children will be too. Take them to vote with you. Um, show them the process. I mean, families that grow up in, in households where politics is often discussed, where they see their parents volunteering, where they watch their parents vote. That's all you have to do. It's, it's really not complicated. You don't have to explain issues to your kids. I mean, you don't have to be part of some intensely political household where you're having debates at the dinner table, although it helps. <laughs> um, but I think that's the, the one number one suggestion I'd give. Take your kids to vote with you this time. It's great. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on that? David Shapiro from the Star Advertiser in his uh, October 23rd column said, you know, in the 2000 election, we had a choice, and the upset Democrats gave their protest votes to Ralph Nader and gave the presidency to George W. Bush over Al Gore. And he said, if we elected a different president, maybe we wouldn't have these wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. So that's a compelling reason to go vote. Votes count. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that before we move on to the next voter? Well, for a lot of millennials, uh, telling them to enact their civic liberties is not particularly enough to get them to go out and vote. Uh, what I've found personally works is social pressure. Hey, are you registered to vote? I'm going on this day. I'm voting early. Hawaii has some of the easiest access to voting in the nation. so. That is exactly right. Mm -hmm. It's not the civic duty messages that work. It is really social pressure. If you want to get your friends and neighbors to vote, ask them, compel them to do so. I mean, that, and the political science literature backs all of this up, that that's the most compelling way. The, the people participate in politics because someone asked them mm -hmm. to.
Well, and, and the other thing I think, and I'm, I'm glad that Wayne brought this up, the idea that a third party candidate uh, such as Ralph Nader could, you know, quote unquote, spoil uh, the election. And I think we're seeing Gary Johnson, um, who was sort of rising the polls and sort of, you know, it was a little bit of a fluctuation. Um, but I think, I think what it is is, you know, it's not about telling millennials to do their civic duty, to go and vote. Um, I think it's about encouraging just everyone, really, that this is an important election. It's not just the top of the ballot. It's not Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, Gary Johnson, Jill Stein, Daryl Castle. Um, you know, it's not any of those guys on the top of the ticket. It's also about the lower, the lower ticket. Absolutely. You know, it's about you know, the mayor's race in, 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 in Honolulu. It's about the 20 city charter amendments we're seeing. It's about the two constitutional amendments on the ballot. These are things that will not come up for another nine, 10 years, and yet we are seeing it on this ballot in this year, in 2016. This is our opportunity, I think, to make a big difference in local politics and in the local scene. And if you talk about that, if you think about that, that's what's gonna matter. Um, and maybe so much the national election, but that's something we're gonna live with for four years, not 10. The, millennial, the millennials should get involved in a movement that wins. I mean, if you're, if you're going to oppose something, if you're going to try to push an agenda and you don't win, it's defeating. So get involved in a coalition, gather up your friends, the people who uh, organized the 1954 Democratic Revolution, they gathered underneath a tree in the Ala Moana Beach Park. You don't have to do that anymore. All you need is your thumbs and your mobile device, and you can gather people, get together, but get involved in something that wins. Is there a cause like that you think that locally could galvanize millennials? Millennials? Not yet, perhaps. Uh, you know, that's, that's a tough question. I think that there are issues that speak to a, a wide range of audiences. We're talking about, obviously, the two divisive issues in the mayor's race about rail and homelessness. Um, is there a specific issue for millennials that really strikes home? I think, in this state, it's possible that that issue could be um, the high cost of home ownership. Mm -hmm. you know, we're talking about millennials who'd, who'd rather you know, live in an apartment, smaller, smaller, not own a home, right? Uh, maybe work job to job to job and just jump, right? We're talking about a generation that, that maybe doesn't want to uh, settle and own a home for a long time. And, you know, I think if we give them that option, it's possible that more and more millennials will shift over. But in a state like Hawaii, where home ownership, as, as Wayne said, is so low and the cost is so high, it's very difficult for millennials at, at this point in time, really, to make that jump. But ironically, you might need to vote to change that situation. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. That's I mean, I don't know if you have to win, but just being part of a movement gives you the skills. I mean, you learn how to make change, even if you lose. But, I mean, the baby boomers had a very central issue to rally around. It was the draft. It was the Vietnam. A huge number of baby boomers who became active in politics did so because they were protesting the Vietnam War. And I think subsequent generations haven't had that moment, and they haven't been socialized into politics in such a dramatic way. I feel that. But as a baby boomer, uh, as soon as we, yeah, I mean, we had our long hair and our blue jeans and whatnot, <laughs> but as soon as we decided to raise a family, the reality hit that, hey, you cannot just cut expenses and afford a home, a car, and sending your children to private school. You needed to increase your revenue, you needed to increase your income, and guess what? We became establishment. <laughs> <laughs> and so the cycle continues. You know? I agree with Colin. I think we haven't had, and, and, and as a millennial, I don't think we've had maybe this, this one galvanizing event or issue. I know that there's a lot of smaller issues that sort of pop up on social media. Right now, the conversation about the Dakota Access Pipeline and how people are talking about that and engaging in that conversation, that's not likely an issue that's going to last for a very long time to galvanize, as, as Colin says, these, these, these voters into this one central event and, and issue. I think what we saw in the 2016 primaries is Bernie Sanders touching on income inequality. Um, I think that was sort of an issue that slid in and is now sort of going down to the bottom of, of the talking points between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. They're not really talking about it too much, um, but I think that would have been, if anything, the issue in the 2016 election that could have galvanized millennials. A touchstone. All right. Some voters can't imagine taking our democracy and the privilege of voting for granted. For Ismail El Sheikh, a recently naturalized American citizen, his first U.S. election is part of a lifelong dream. It is first time. It is, uh, I, like I hear that it is a historical uh, election, maybe because it's just my first time to, to vote. 
<laughs> so I am lucky to, uh, uh, to be able to vote, and this is my uh, privilege. I, during the Mubarak time, I voted uh, two times. Uh, when he gave promise that it will fa be fair election. Usually, during the Mubarak regime, it was no fair election. So when I thought that it was be fair, uh, I voted uh, just to ex exercise my, <laughs> my right. To be American citizen, it, is my, it was my dream. When I uh, was young, that I heard that America is a land of freedom. I thought that uh, I would be able more to utilize my degree in America. So I came as a visitor uh, in uh, Ramadan, month of Ramadan, in 1998, for one month. And then I came back in 1999 also for uh, Ramadan for one month. So I loved it more. And then I came for good in 2000. Uh, since that, it's my dream to be an American citizen, to be able to uh, uh, raise my voice and uh, uh, vote in the uh, different elections. Because I think my vote will be respected. It will make difference. And uh, we think, uh, as, as, uh, as Muslims, that um, to be uh, positive is not optional, it is mandatory, it is duty upon everyone uh, to exercise his right to change the situation that he think he may be able to make it better. Uh, when I talked to my children, I found out they are uh, politically matured. <laughs> it was very uh, important for us as a family to sit together around the TV and see uh, the debates and see how the, the two of them are thinking and who will be good uh, for Americans and especially for Muslim Americans. To just be free and to have the right to vote. And we can see Egypt, Syria, Iraq, and many countries. Just the, the fight for the democracy and thousands of people, they lost their life just to find the free uh, country and free land, uh, they can raise their voice and they can choose their leaders. So what we have here in America, we should thank uh, God for it and uh, be uh, grateful for it by practice the democracy and support the democracy. What we have uh, here in America uh, is d d uh, diversity and we should keep this, uh, uh, the uh, harmony that we live and the, the relationship between the different religions, different cultures. And this is what great about America. I heard the uh, uh, negative statements from the, uh, the uh, uh, elections. Uh, uh, it, it will lead this society and this, uh, uh, this great country to dark way. We don't like it. We don't like this way. Uh, 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 people, I, I, can, I can say for sure, millions of people around the world, their dream is to come to America, to live to America. Why? Because the freedom, the diversity, the respect between the different cultures and different religions. We don't like to lose it. We like to keep it and maintain it. Mr. Moore, are immigrant families, do they tend to be more politically active, uh, more consistent voters? Uh, they don't, actually. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a very heartwarming story. And I mean, th this does highlight why we should treasure the right to vote. But the truth of the matter is most immigrant voters uh, are, don't look like the gentleman who was just interviewed who are extremely well-educated and articulate. Most actually find the American political process desperately confusing, which it is. I mean, there's almost no political process in the world that is as confusing as the United States with the local, state, national elections, bizarre rules from the 18th century like the Electoral College. It's incredibly <laughs> intimidating. And so what happens is that actually most first-generation immigrants don't really vote. They don't really have a sense of who the Republican and Democratic parties are. Um, but there still, I think, are ways for immigrant families to model civic behavior. And second and third-generation um, 
of course, look very like any Americans who were, who were born in this country. Um, but we haven't actually done a particularly good job uh, integrating Americans, I mean, uh, newly arrived Americans and immigrants in, into politics. But part of that is, is we should be honest that our system is very complicated. Mm -hmm. And if you could imagine arriving somewhere else where you barely spoke the language, and people were trying to uh, explain all of these rules to you. What is a Republican? What is a Democrat? What, what does liberal mean? Mm -hmm. and people could understandably be overwhelmed by that. We obviously have a very high rate of immigration in uh, Hawaii. Is that a part of this puzzle? Is there something we could be doing to reach out to those communities? I don't know that, uh, I mean, there are a lot of immigrants moving in. I mean, they're moving in at a rate of like eight per day, and they're buying up a lot of property. Uh, to get them involved in the local politics, I think, is kind of a stretch because a lot of them, I think, are just, you know, part-time residents here. And to get them to really get involved in the day-to-day -day dealings of the society, I think that's really a long stretch. Any other thoughts in terms of, of the experience for different immigrant groups? How, what can we learn from the man we just, just heard from? You know, I think he's a very, uh, very heartwarming case, as Colin said, and and, and um, sort of one of those cases where you you get to sort of understand you know, the true gift of voting. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, in terms of in terms of what he's talking about, um, do you do you see that that trend among among a lot of immigrants? You know, I'm not so sure. What I understand is. Uh, you know that in this presidential election, as, as Wayne said, it is hard to get local election, you know, sort of interest and, and gauge that interest. But in terms of a national election, what you're looking at is a candidate who has clearly, you know, denounced immigration. He says he's going to build a wall between here and Mexico and make Mexico pay for it. Um, and then you have a candidate who, who is, you know, talking about, or, or as some people would like to claim, is talking about um, open borders or at least a, an, a more open country. Um, we have to remember, of course, that America is a nation of immigrants and that at one point in time, you know, our ancestors were all immigrants. Um, understanding that, America, in, in a sort of sense, has been built by immigrants. And, and so taking that into context, what we're really saying is, is that um, immigrants uh, are sort of the backbone of American society. What they do and what they can contribute to the society is very important. So when when you put it into that context, I think you can understand very clearly that, that these immigrants um, can be a very, very vocal group, uh, they, and they can be sort of, like this gentleman here, very fascinated by America and and actually having this, this, this newfound right to vote for your leaders, elect them to office. That's not something that you'll see in a modern day a millennial voter who's spent you know years upon years upon years of being disenfranchised or you know disinvolved with politics. Let's talk for one second before we go to the next voter about this presidential election. Uh, we were speaking earlier and, and many of you on the panel felt that the negativity surrounding it might further dampen some of the voting enthusiasm. In Hawaii, we've got a bunch of comments from Linda in Pearl City, a uh, se uh, senior, senior citizen involved in an organization with very smart, professional retired people. Uh, she says she's surprised that they are not interested in voting because they do not support Trump or Hillary. Uh, we've got other questions on this. As a panel uh, speaking to the importance of voting, is that a responsible decision? Can you decide to simply not vote because you don't like either presidential candidate? Mr. Moore. Sure. I mean, you're also making a choice by not voting. I mean, I want to be clear that there are many ways to participate in politics. Voting is one of them. And just because you're not voting doesn't mean you, you can't have a voice in the next few years. Um, but I do think that we're, we're, we're seeing this phenomenon during this election, which is that people are so angry and frustrated that they don't feel like participating to vote for either candidate. And you often see this when the two people at the top of the ticket, Donald Trump and, and uh, Hillary Clinton, have such high negatives. We've never seen two candidates uh, who are frankly so hated as these two. And the result of that is people tend not to vote for the down ticket races. So I guess I'd say to people who are thinking about that, fine, don't vote for Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. You're voting in Hawaii. For that race, you're, the chance of your vote making a difference is vanishingly close to zero. But you still have an opportunity to participate in all of these local races, in the charter amendments. There's a lot of things you can do. Go so ahead. fine, don't vote for the top of the ticket, but come to vote for the charter vote amendments. Vote for everything else. Shada, you're nodding. Your thoughts on this? Oh, I absolutely agree. 
Um, and especially in terms of what Spencer was talking about earlier with um, newly arrived immigrants, this national, uh, this national race definitely has galvanized uh, many newly arrived um, international students I know who have recently gained their citizenship. I'm not too sure how they feel about uh, the local races. Obviously less invested, they are new to Hawaii, but... Um, but for them, some of the rhetoric surrounding the presidential election has sparked oh, interest. Absolutely. This interest in that. Well, let's bring it down a notch. Let's go to the Honolulu mayor's race where there's a lot of negativity, negativity too. We look at them having 73%, 72% of the vote. But you look at the number of people who had blank votes, 3,902%. I mean, any candidate that had that 2% would overshadow the, the other one in this small little race, but it's just the negative negativity that I think people are just turned off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I agree. And I think uh, very often, and in the state of Hawaii, it's sort of this, this odd thing, is the top of the ticket is the most important thing. And as we've seen with um, only one of the previous voters, you know, very often we don't see the top of the ticket even sort of mattering because our polls don't close until um, long after they call the election for one or the other. Um, you know, like I said before, what's really important is, as Colin said, the bottom of the, of the ticket, mm -hmm. the bottom of the ballot, all the things that, you know, are just, are, are part of the local politics. City charter amendments don't come up for another 10 years. Constitutional amendments are not required to show up for another nine years. And these are things that will not be on a ballot until the middle of the next decade, you know? Um, and at the end of the day, you know, after next Tuesday, what's going to matter is not the national election. You know, you're going to go home to your friends, you're going to go home to your family, you're going to go home to your neighbors and your coworkers. And those are the people you're going to have to face for the next four years. Now, are you someone who's going to say, oh, I just voted for the top of the ticket, I didn't really care about the local elections? Or are you going to be that person who says, well, you know what, local elections did matter to me as well. Mm -hmm. Because this is a decision that's going to impact my community, impact my family. And those are the decisions I think that really, really, really do matter. We've all heard the pundits talk about the importance of the millennial vote. For some, this is their first time voting in a presidential election. David Enriquez couldn't be more ready. It's really been a roller coaster, um, just with the amount of I guess, saturation within uh, the media. Um, I think last semester I was actually subscribed to the New York Times, and so. I'd be getting all these notifications as the primaries would roll, roll through. And it's just been a huge mass of information. Just, um, it's always constantly on your mind. I've been, I'll be quite honest, I've been actually trying to tune it out as much as I can as a midterms have been coming up, but it just always keeps on coming back. And um, I'm actually pretty excited for this thing to be over. When I uh, voted for the first time, I was really excited because I thought that, you know, it's actually within my hands to, you know, help towards a greater movement to maybe stop someone from getting um, support from our state. And for me, just seeing that sort of fizzle out, it just sort of brought me back down just, you know, thinking, okay, it's, voting is not really what I thought it would be. There's a grander process to what's going on. And I think, especially for this election, especially for millennials, it's more of an eye opener towards the process of voting rather than the essence of voting itself. Twitter is sort of the hot thing going on right now. And that is really driving uh, one of the campaigns and I think for me I feel like having this low is good in the sense that we know what to look forward in the future. Um, for me as a student I'm more for uh, learning now and applying it to the, um, to the future and for me um, for millennials I think that's where your hope can be found in the sense that we know what not to do uh, in our politics and we know what we should look forward to or work towards uh, in the future. That's where um, you know, we can sort of turn like a weakness into a strength in the sense that we were so passionate about this candidate and it kind of forced us to look at the bigger picture of things. I know there's this conversation about um, looking towards the entire process of things, how the primaries are held, how super delegates are delegated or how delegates are, you know, given the choice overall. And I think for us, or the challenge for millennials is to sort of examine that process as well as try to find a way to critique and fix that process so that when I guess certain these star candidates come up again, then we have the opportunity to um, have them work with the system and get them where we want them to go. 
I believe so, yeah. Um, I believe that would be the best ideal for our state in the sense of the backgrounds that we sort of come from, where it may be liberal, maybe conservative, but uh, the way I see it is that we found a way to, um, you know, work it out. But by working it out, we've sort of secluded certain ideas. And for me, I believe the benefit or the beauty of democracy is in the debate, in the sense that you have two opposing sides that try to find that compromise. But what comes out of that compromise is the best thing you can have. For me, it, it all comes down to your responsibility and your role uh, in the society that we want to create. I mean, you were you know, gung-ho for Bernie and you know, you fizzled out, but there's a greater picture that we have to look at because ultimately we're going to have to live through this decision and for us um, to decide what we want for our future, I believe that is where I believe everyone ha should have a say and you should not waste that um, voice within that. And for me, it's all about creating your own history. And you know, by abstaining from this sort of vote would be an extreme injustice for our American society and I guess you know, the future or the direction of the world that we want to live in. The way that I would envision Hawaii, or the, the Hawaii that I would love to live in, would be one where it would be an example to the rest of the US. Um, I guess one of the main points is that uh, coming up is that the uh, top 48 is actually becoming increasingly diversified. And you're seeing all this tension going around. And for me, what I would hope for Hawaii to be is a place where there are multiple um, viewpoints and certain perspectives. But because of the nature where we're at, we're on you know, tiny rock in the middle of the ocean, we actually you know, find a way to both compromise and find a way to move forward from our differences in order to make sure that everyone within this um, island or this island chain is taken care of. And you know, there's that respect as well as um, you know, that trust between um, citizens. And for me, I feel like Hawaii um, is going to be that example. Sensor, I saw a lot of nodding coming from you. Did anything strike you in particular? Um, you know, it is a well-known fact that a lot of millennials were involved in this process because they felt the burn, you know? And that forced them to understand this, this process, this very complicated, as Colin mentioned earlier, this complicated process of, of the electoral college and understanding not only what happens in the national election and the general election, but also the primaries, right? And that totally different system. And engaging them in that system and engaging them in, in understanding that, that, um, that setup uh, and then as, as, as David just you know, mentioned, then going the step beyond and, and saying, okay, well, what can we do to help this system, to fix this system? I think what um, a lot of engaged millennials um, are talking about is, well, how do we make the system better? How do we make the system more inclusive? How do we engage more people? Um, and, and very often, uh, or at least sometimes, I think millennials are met with you know, responses from an older generation saying, well, this is the way we've always done things. This is the way it is. You know? And then the conversation gets shut down. What I think needs to happen is instead of shutting the conversation down with just saying, well, <laughs> right, how are we going to, that's the way it's always happened, is OK. You know, let's have that conversation. It's just a conversation. Mm -hmm. There's no harm in it. Um, but having that conversation is really integral and really important, not only to stoking the fire within, um, as, as Wayne mentioned earlier, this generation that is going to inherit um, this political process, this system, this country, um, but also talking about you know, this group of people who I think, um, by and large, do want to get involved. I think in many ways, um, they're maybe seeing some resistance to that um, and being shut down in places where, where maybe it's most important that they are involved now. Where do you think the shutdown is happening? Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's again, right, uh, in the conversations. Uh, how can we make any system better, right? We're talking about a group of people who, um, you know, these millennials have seen the negative effects of what we've been doing to the environment and climate change, or how we've set up the big banks and how in 2008 the whole market crashed and now we're seeing the results of that. What we're seeing, or I think what I think a lot of millennials are seeing, um, is that, you know, there are th very good things that the baby boomers and, and uh, you know, these sort of preceding generations have done. Um, there's a lot that can be fixed or changed or, or you know, sort of worked on in some way. And if we don't start that conversation with the generation that is eventually going to inherit those things, we're not going to see change. We're not going to see that involvement in the political process uh, that I think is necessary. Wayne? But there is a strategy to win. And I think, well, in 2002, when Linda Lingle, Republican, went against Maisie Hirono, 
She got 35% of the Democrats to vote for her, and that wasn't an easy feat. We're talking about 96, 97,000 votes. And so there's a strategy to win. You can't win with one ethnic group. You can't win with just one little niche in the society. You've got to get a, uh, you know, a collaboration that is much bigger, but there is a strategy to win. And I think Linda Lingle showed everyone the way to do it. You know, I have the unique privilege of getting to spend time with millennial voters every day in my classes <laughs> um, and talking with them about politics. And one thing is true is that they have got to be some of the more cynical people I, I have met about the political process um, who really do feel disenfranchised. I mean, they're students of the recession. And so part of that is taking enthusiastic millennials uh, like David um, and having them talk to their friends about politics and not accepting, no, I don't care and I'm not going to turn out to vote as an answer. This social pressure is incredibly powerful, but it does take everyone, millennials in particular, having awkward conversations with their friends and their siblings to say, no, you need to go vote. Mm -hmm. You need to pay attention to this. Mm -hmm. We have lots of questions coming in. Shonda, let me ask you this one. What does the panel think about lower voting age to, lowering the voting age to 16 to increase awareness and participation? Schools can build registration to civics and other school programs for teens. Good idea? I'm not so sure. There have been lots of arguments against lowering the voting age. Um, before it was 18, it was 21, and the biggest argument was uh, younger people are not politically mature enough to be making these sort of uh, important decisions. 16, um, I think it's, it has good interest at heart, but um, I'm not too sure how galvanized a 16-year-old or a, a normal 16-year-old would be uh, about voting in a national election, right. especially in terms of a one so uh, heavily polarized as this one. All right, Spencer. Fundamentally, I think I disagree with that. Um, and the reason I say this is because America started out um, with, a, with a voting group of uh, white landowning men. And very, very um, you know, slowly, I think uh, more and more people were enfranchised. With Jackson, it was all white men. Um, under Wilson, it was women, right? At the time, in those, in those uh, movements to get the vote for more people, there was this conversation that took place of, oh, they're not ready. What are they going to do with the vote? What are they going to, right? And, and because a lot of people who did have the right to vote were saying those things, they didn't start that conversation. They didn't allow the, the new group, the new enfranchised group to step up and say, you know what? No, we are ready for this. Now, we're talking about a group of, of people who are, as, as Shonda said, very young. Um, does that prevent them from talking about the political process? I don't think so. Um, but if we don't give them that opportunity, if we don't give them that chance, um, what we're really saying is, I mean, step to the sidelines. Let so the adults take over. It is something you'd like to see considered. Um, I think it. I think it's something I'd like to see talked about. Uh -huh. um, I think we're very far away from maybe considering something like that, like a constitutional amendment to lower the voting age. But I think it is a conversation that needs to be started. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah. All right. We'll we'll move on to a comment from Hannibal. Why do I hear much mention of millennial voters and baby boomers, yet Gen Xers like me are left out of the discussion? And this is true. We have not addressed Gen X, which I think is my generation, if I remember correctly. Any thoughts on Generation X? Generation X is, is the smallest group that we were talking about. We've got the Generation Z, which is bigger than the millennials. And Generation Xers are that in-between group that we've got the big baby boomer population that are overshadowing them, not giving them a chance. But Generation X has Senator Brian Schatz, and they've got you know some other uh, people, even uh, Charles DeJou is a Generation Xer, I think. So they rep they're represented in the political process, uh, but the Generation X, I agree, is the forgotten generation. And they are, of course, the ones with the children whom we're all wanting to be educated, to be involved, right? So in a way, they are key to that. Yeah. Any thoughts on Generation X? Well, so I'm either a very young, I mean, a very, very old Xer, or the youngest possible millennial, I, I realized. But um, I think it's true. I mean, Xers are an interesting group. They actually tend to be some of the more conservative voters because they were mainly socialized 
during a time when the Republican Party was quite popular. Reagan. Um, Reagan, um, H.W. Bush. Um, but I think they are often left out of these conversations. I mean, they're, the millennials have this unique um, a property because they were socialized into politics during the social media and internet age. And mm -hmm. the Xers are kind of caught in the middle. So there actually haven't been as many studies about them. Yeah, just not registering. From Katie in Hilo, what percentage of Hawaii voters have already done early walk-in voting? How does this compare to the last election? Anyone have stats in terms of what's happening this election or too early for that? All we know is uh, by, by Saturday, more than half of the voters will have voted either early walk-in or through the absentee ballot. All right, from Susan on Molokai, regarding the immigrant issue, don't people applying for citizenship get the basics, quote unquote, of the voting election process? Perhaps the panel is not giving immigrants enough credit. Is there an education process um, in, involved in citizenship? Well, you usually, you, I mean, you have to pass a test. It depends if you're a refugee, the, the, uh, the rules but are But in terms of voting different. and elections? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a civics test, but it's, it's a little more, I mean, the partisanship and all of the rules, I think, leave people a bit confused. So, I mean, there are certainly some immigrants that participate at high levels, but all of the studies show that for the most part, first generation immigrants who already struggle with English uh, certainly struggle with our electoral rights. It might happen with the succeeding generation. Well, I think there's also quite possibly maybe even a different um, take on that. And, and that is, you know, sure, they can be educated and sure they'll probably need to know a, a lot of that stuff in order to take this the civics test or the, the citizenship exam. But does that translate to interest? Does that translate to them wanting to be involved in that process? Um, you know, I, I don't know. And I think, you know, uh, there maybe haven't been enough studies to determine how that interest is generated, how, as, as one of the voters said earlier, how, how this interest in, in American democracy and American uh, a way of life, so to speak, um, how that interest is generated, how it's created. Um, and so do we, do we say that that means immigrants are not voting or, or are not interested in voting. No, I, I, what we're saying is that, and I think what Colin is saying is that currently the numbers don't show. Yeah, um, but that can change uh, as things often do. And I don't want to demean the process, but I think it's likened to when you get your driver's license and you have to pass this test, you sort of memorize everything. Yeah. Does that make you a better driver? Probably not. We're in our final moments. I'm going to try to get through a bunch of these. Is there ever the possibility of Hawaii voters voting on the Saturday before election in order to boost voter turnout? And in conjunction with that, does the time zone issue for Hawaii and Alaska contribute to low voter turnout from Alex and Kona? And do you think the Electoral College discourages people from voting here in Hawaii? If so, that's from Tom in Waikiki. You spoke of changes. Is there anything we could ever do to try to change that? Or is that the system we have? That's the system we have. We're not going to get rid of the electoral <laughs> Right, college. clearly, but in, in terms, of the, oh, in terms of the timing. Oh, in terms of the timing. In terms of trying to switch the hours of voting or anything. I don't think it would make much of a difference, right. to be honest. I don't think that's the core problem. No, the, I don't think so either. And I think to get people more involved, you've got to find out who's voting and who's not voting and, you know, couch the issues to get everyone involved in the issues that are important to them. And you spoke earlier of the ownership issue. Of the home ownership, I think, is a right. big deal. Um, it's the interest, right? Uh, I think a lot of people are immediately interested in the top of the ticket. As we've said time and time um, during this entire uh, session, right, it's about um, who's at the top of the ticket, right? Are we voting Hillary Clinton? Are we voting Donald Trump? Are we voting whoever else, right? Any third party candidate. Um, and you know what, if that's why you're turning out, turn out, you know, go and vote for those people. But also understand that there are issues, right? And there are um, local elections, right? And those often get neglected. And, and so maybe, yes, uh, Hawaii doesn't necessarily play a role sometimes, a lot of the time, but in national might. elections, but. Last question, really quick, last final moment. This has been such a negative, negative election nationally and in, in some ways locally. Do you have a hope that there might be a reaction to this negativity and maybe the next election cycle will see a little bit more inspiration and some higher turnout? Or do you think we're mired in this for a time to come? Is this the new reality? Very briefly. This is the new reality. This American is politics is hyper-polarized. I'd be lying if I said anything else. <laughs> Wayne? <laughs> yes. I mean, it's going, to be, it's going to be negative. Everyone's going to go negative, and it's too bad. Any thoughts on that? I don't think people should let the cynicism discourage them. I mean, like we've discussed, 
locally, our vote absolutely matters. All right, Spencer. You know, it takes a lot, you know, and, and you know what, as, as Shonda said, don't let the cynicism take over. The trend will become, I think, negative, but um, I do think that every once in a while, uh, as it did in the 2016 primaries, there maybe sometimes will be a candidate that will gal galvanize uh, a sort of a generation of hope and a generation of change, you know, a future that we can believe in. And I think that's when, and in those moments, uh, when America and its populace, I think, will shine. All right, we'll end it there. Thank you so much. Go vote for someone you like, as opposed to don't vote against someone you don't like. All right, I like that for parting advice. Thank you all. <laughs> Mahalo for joining us tonight. Coming up next week on Insights on PBS Hawaii, we'll wrap up our election 2016 coverage with a look at what we can expect in the coming year from our three levels of government representation. U.S. Senator Maisie Hirono, plus Speaker of the House Joe Suki, and Senate President Ron Kochi will talk about what they expect to accomplish this year and how they will work together on certain issues. Then we'll hear from local county council members. Honolulu City Council Chair Ernie Martin will be here, and we've invited representatives from the Hawaii, Maui, and Kauai County Councils to join us. At the heart of the discussion, we'll ask the important question, what can voters expect will get done in the coming year? That's next time on Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Malia Maddock. Ahui ho.